Good morning and welcome to our online Sunday morning worship here at Leeds Central. It's good to greet you. Today is Trinity Sunday and we have various songs along that theme for you to join in with and two lovely pieces of music from the band and songsters to look forward to. Thanks to Ben for arranging and running our online quiz last night. Given I'm recording this before the event, I'm going to guess that Jonathan and Danny won um, and suggest that we keep a lookout for further social events in the coming weeks. I have just a couple of other announcements for you. Uh, Valhausen would like to thank everyone for their cards and phone calls. She's doing well and sees the oncologist at the end of June. There are others in our fellowship who still need our prayers and we are continuing to send those requests out through the care groups. Uh, if you are a care group leader, please can you make sure those messages are passed on. Uh, it really helps to keep our fellowship connected. So thank you for all you do. You do. We continue to be busy serving food at our hall and uh, we've now served over 2,000 hot meals, but from this week, we'll no longer be doing that on a Wednesday. As the government eases some of the restrictions on movement and increases what we're allowed to do, I urge you to keep safe. Um, as a leadership team, we'll be starting to look at what that means for our fellowship in the coming weeks and months. So your prayers would be appreciated for that. We're gonna start our service this morning with the song, Thou Whose Almighty Word, to the tune of Moscow. A call to worship. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who spoke in the beginning and created something out of nothing. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one who took on the clothing of humanity to set those who were oppressed free. Let us worship the triune God. Let us worship the one whose spirit rests continually upon us calling us from sorrow-filled endings to bright new beginnings. Come, Come let, let us, us worship, worship the, the triune, triune God. God. Amen. Amen. And now we're going to sing again. And the verses start, The splendour of the King, clothed in majesty. But the chorus says, How great is our God.
people had been baptized Jesus also was baptized while he was praying heaven was opened and the Holy Spirit came down upon him in bodily form like a dove and a voice came from heaven you are my own dear son I am pleased with you John chapter 14 verses 23 to 26 Jesus answered him, Whoever loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and my Father and I will come to him and live with him. Whoever does not love me does not obey my teaching, and the teaching you have heard is not mine, but comes from the Father who sent me. I have told you this while I am still with you. The Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and make you remember that I have told you. John chapter 16, verses 12 to 15. I have much more to tell you, but now it will be too much for you to bear. When, however, the Spirit comes, who reveals the truth about God, he will lead you into all the truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but he will speak of what he hears and will tell you of things to come. 
He will give me glory because he will take what I say and tell it to you. All that my Father has is mine. That is why I said that the Spirit will take what I give him and tell it to you. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 3 to 6. <clears throat> Do your best to preserve the unity which the Spirit gives by means of the peace that binds you together. There is one body and one spirit, just as there is one hope to which God has called you. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. There is one God and Father of all, who is Lord of all, works through all, and is in all. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. <clears throat> the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Sermons uh, have different nature, different characters, different styles. Some are pure preaching, some are encouragement and exhortation, some are uh, admonishment, and some are to teach a truth of the Christian faith. And this morning on Trinity Sunday, I find that I need to preach in that last style and to share with you my understanding of the Trinity, hoping that it enlightens you for this most difficult of doctrines. One of the earliest of Christian creeds, called the Athanasian Creed, has these words included in it. We worship one God in Trinity and Trinity in unity, neither confounding the persons nor dividing the substance. For there is one person of the Father, another of the Son, and another of the Holy Ghost. But the Godhead of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost is all one. The glory equal, the majesty co-eternal. Now that doctrine also says the Father is incomprehensible, the Son incomprehensible, and the Holy Ghost incomprehensible. And yet there are not three incomprehensibles, but one incomprehensible. So my job is a simple one this morning. I have to take something which is incomprehensible, meaning it's unintelligible, it's unfathomable, it's inexplicable, it's inconceivable, it's perplexing, it's beyond our understanding, and I've got to try to make it understandable. Simples. The other week I said about trying to get our heads into the understanding of the first century Christians in order to fully understand what has happened and how we have our Christian heritage today. And so that is with this doctrine of the Trinity. Throughout years, many people have tried to explain what the Trinity is. St. Patrick's, for instance, in Ireland, took a three-leaf shamrock to explain the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit being one. But any illustration only takes us so far. How can we go deeper in our understanding of a God who is three and at the same time one. Well, as with all matters of faith and doctrine, our foundation stone of understanding is and has to be Jesus. So let's start there and let's ask the question that at some point those first disciples must have challenged themselves with, namely, is Jesus God? The second point then we need to consider to understand the Trinity is this. What did Jesus teach about God the Father and their relationship? And the third point, what did Jesus teach about the Holy Spirit and their relationship? So first of all, is Jesus God? It's the answer to this question that separates Christianity from all other religions, particularly that of Islam and Judaism. They believe that Jesus was no more than a good man, a miracle worker, a prophet even. Christians believe that Jesus is none other than God become flesh that wrapped up in, in, in his human body was the fullness of the deity of God, that he was the exact representation of God. However, for the sake of our argument this morning, 
I want us to try and enter into the heads of those first disciples who had been called to follow him from the shores of Lake Galilee. They were not the rabbis and the scholars. They were just plain, ordinary men who had a very simple outlook on life. And if they could understand the divinity of Jesus, surely anyone could. What then would they have needed to have known? What would they have had to have seen? What would they have needed to experience for them to include Jesus as God? Another man who lived at the time, John the Baptist, almost asked this same question. He said, are you the one who is to come or should we expect someone else? We also discovered Jesus' answer. For he replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk. Those who have leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. And I kind of think that as those early disciples played around in their minds with that same question, they remembered the teaching that Jesus had shared with them of his claim to be the bread of life, the true vine, the resurrection and the life, the way, the truth, the life, the good shepherd, the light of the world, the gateway of the sheepfold, and so on. They thought about Jesus walking on water. They thought of Jesus calming the sea, of Jesus feeding 5,000 people, of Jesus healing the sick and raising the dead even. And we've got to remember that these early followers of Christ were first and foremost followers of the Jewish faith, believers in a monotheistic God, that there was just one God, the Lord God Jehovah. So this was a massive hurdle for them to accept then that Jesus, the carpenter of Nazareth, was Lord and God. That's why the exclamation of Thomas after the resurrection was such a key pronouncement. My Lord and my God. It was equal only by the recognition of Peter when he said earlier, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. If they had trouble coming to terms with it, then it's no wonder that we do. As they saw in him, in that resurrected body, they could only come to the one conclusion, Jesus is Lord, Jesus is God. And a later disciple, also a Jew, the Apostle Paul, he wrote in Colossians 1 that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. And in Hebrews chapter 1 we read, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. These Jewish monotheistic followers of Jesus had no option, no alternative, other than to include Jesus as part of a triune God. The second point then we need to consider to understand the Trinity is this. What did Jesus teach about God the Father and their relationship? But first, we hand over to our core treasurer, Mark Scrimshaw, and his wife, Alison, who are going to lead us in some intercessions this morning. Good morning. Shall we pray? On this Trinity Sunday, we have come before you, Lord, to offer our praise and adoration. You are God, the Creator, giving us richly all things to enjoy. You are Christ, the Saviour of the world, made flesh to set us free. You are the Spirit of truth and love, willing to dwell in us. You are holy and blessed, one God, eternal Trinity. Be near to us the people formed in your image and close to the world your love brings to life. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, we pray for your church throughout the world, for those that are thriving and those that have lost a sense of direction. We give thanks for the church, for Leeds Central Core and its people, and gladly acknowledge all the gifts you have given us through its life. We ask you to open wide our hearts that we may welcome the strangers and share our faith with others. 
Open wide our minds that we may receive new truth and understanding of your will. Open wide our lives that through discipline and prayer we may experience your power in daily living. Lord, you have chosen men and women to serve you in ministry of your church and given them the perfect example in the person of your son. Pour your blessings on your servants today, especially those of our own church, for Cliff and for Joy, that by word and deed they may proclaim your saving love and so enable us to grow in your image. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord of the universe, we praise you for your creation. You have provided mankind with everything it needs for life and health. Grant that the resources of the earth may neither be hoarded by the selfish nor squandered by the foolish, but all may share your gifts. We remember all who bear the responsibility of leadership, the heads of states, ambassadors and political advisers. Let your will for our world be accomplished through the decisions they make and give them a vision of peace and reconciliation. For you, Lord, can find a way when men and women are lost. Lord, we pray for peace in the world, creating us a love for peace, not peace that is absent from struggle, nor peace that is blind to injustice, but peace that makes whole what now is broken. We remember those who struggle against injustice, for men and women who have to establish love supremacy in violent and oppressive societies, and for those whom war and famine have robbed of homes, families and friends. May they be filled with your strength and wisdom and grant that where the love of man has failed, your divine compassion may heal. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We remember this morning those who are sick, sad or lonely and those who are brave and patient when things are going wrong. We pray that they may be aware of your comforting presence and know that in your hands they are safe and loved. Lord, we pray for all those whose life is saddened by the death of a loved one. Be with them in their loneliness and let them know that Jesus Christ is the light of the world, a light which no darkness can quench. We bring before God those who have died during this COVID pandemic and light a candle to symbolize the light of Christ which eternally shines and brings hope. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Lord, we ask you to lead us into the coming week. Help us to believe that you are close by us. Keep us from making mistakes and help us to never disappoint you. When we face hard decisions or difficult work, when we enjoy ourselves and have fun with others, may we know that you share these times with us. Lord, Lord in, in your, your mercy, mercy hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Thank you, Mark and Alison. So what did Jesus teach about God the Father and their relationship? There's so much that we could say uh, on Jesus' teaching that we could be here for literally, literally years. There have been countless books written on the subject and I need to condense a lot of that into just a few minutes. So to start off with, we know that from the Lord's Prayer that Jesus called God Abba which is the earliest manner of speaking about a father that a child had. So it's the equivalent of our papa or dada. We know from the Sermon on the Mount that Jesus taught of the immense care and love that the father has for us. And we know from the story of Jesus at prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus had to commit himself to follow the will of the father. Now each of these show us two separate entities, Jesus and the Father, and we could have taken a whole load of others. Had we been at our place of worship now, I would have put up some images of famous fathers such and their sons, like Michael and Kirk Douglas, or Harry and Jamie Redknapp. And I would have asked you to have looked at their similarities and at their differences. So just for a minute, I need you to imagine 
a father and a son. Perhaps uh, a father and son combination that are close to you. Perhaps even your own father and yourself or you and your own son. It also works with a daughter or a mother. What are those similarities and what are the differences? You see, when we look at this, it's easy to see that Jesus and the Father are two separate, distinct beings. But if Jesus is God, as we've already said, how can they be the same as well as being distinct? On one of those occasions when the Jewish people sought to kill Jesus, as a story we find in, in John chapter 5, Jesus went on to say these words about his relationship with the Father. He said that just as the Father raises the dead and gives life, so does he. He gives life. They were the same. He said that whoever does not honour the Son does not honour the Father. They were the same. He said, the Father has life in himself, the Son has life in himself. They were the same. At a later time, again after a, another time when they tried to seize him, Jesus said, if you knew me, you would know my Father also. They were the same. On the evening before his passion, while at supper with his disciples, he taught them more fully and more intimately about his relationship with the Father. And I suggest that you might like to read that for yourself in John chapters 14 through to John chapter 17. Jesus quite clearly taught this. He and the Father were one, therefore he was God. He also taught that he and the Father were distinct entities. And so in the famous words of those great doctrine teachers, the Spice Girls, two become one. But wait, there's more to come after we've heard from Major Stuart Barker and his choice of music for us today. Last week, the Salvation Army and many other parts of the Christian Church for Pentecost Sunday were singing William Booth's great words, Send the Fire. This week, for Trinity Sunday, for the band music, we turned to Reginald Heber, who was a contemporary of William Booth. An Anglican priest, he became Bishop of Calcutta, aged only 40, with the whole of India as his diocese. This huge burden cost his health, and he sadly died only three years later. But this dedicated Christian leader, whose statue stands in St Paul's Cathedral, left the whole Christian church at least one amazing legacy. His great hymn, speaking so eloquently about the Trinity, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. It takes its inspiration partly from Revelation chapter 4, which says of the angels, Day and night they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. So here this morning, as the band music, is Ray Steadman Allen's simple but majestic setting of the hymn tune, Nicaea.
Well, thank you, Stuart, for that choice of music, and I'm sure that you, like me, were uh, singing along to those great words. Let's return to uh, those spice skills and that uh, doctrine teaching of theirs, two becomes one. It's not quite right, is it? Because it's three becomes one. What did Jesus teach about the Holy Spirit and their relationship? Friends, let's not make the mistake that before Jesus came to this planet as a baby, before the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost, that there was only one part to the Godhead and that the Son and the Spirit came later on, later editions, as it were. That wasn't the case. Listen to what the Scripture says, for instance, about Jesus and creation. In the beginning was the Word, says John 1, 1 to 3, and the Word was with God and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made, and without him nothing was made that has been made. Colossians 1, 15 to 17, we've already referred to. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth. All things have been created through him, and for him he's before all things and then genesis 1 makes it clear that the holy spirit was operational even in creation and we read those great words and the spirit of god hovered over the face of the water job 26 13 also says by his spirit he adorned the heavens we could go through the old testament book by book showing examples of a God who is the one and only God being described with plural pronouns and distinct parts of God being revealed, but time doesn't allow us to do so. And so we return to our first disciples who were filled with the person of the Holy Spirit and had to somehow come to accept that this was the Spirit of Jesus being given to them. And as we look at the teaching of Jesus, he makes it clear that he knew the Holy Spirit not, not as an essence, not as a power, but as a person. He never refers to the Holy Spirit as it, but always speaks of the Holy Spirit as he. For instance, in John 14, he says to his disciples, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you to be with him forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him but it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. This, my friends, is one of the clearest passages we have in the Bible that reveals this Trinitarian aspect of our God who is one. Jesus will ask the Father to send the Holy Spirit, another advocate, a comforter, or to use the Greek name a paraclete. If we had time... We could cover all the descriptions of the Holy Spirit and see that each of the emotions and acts are characteristic of a person, not an impersonal force. The Holy Spirit is God himself and all the attributes of God are also ascribed to the Holy Spirit. So the Bible states that he is eternal, that he is all-powerful, that he is omnipresent, that he is omniscient, that he is a creator. And then we have the benediction that John Jowett read for us earlier. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. The Holy Spirit is one with the Father and one with the Spirit. One of the easiest ways of explaining this is with a mathematical equation. And we are not now trying to make one plus one plus one to equal one. We are recognising that one times one times one does indeed equal one. The Father is God. Jesus is God. The Holy Spirit is God. I said at the start that trying to explain the concept of the Trinity was like trying to explain that which was inexplicable. And I'm glad that no less a person than Billy Graham in his book on the Holy Spirit declares that he is as nonplussed as I am. He goes on to say, though, this truth. This is a terribly difficult subject, he says, far beyond the ability of our limited minds to grasp fully. 
Nevertheless, it is extremely important to declare what the Bible holds and be silent where the Bible is silent. God the Father is fully God. God the Son is fully God. God the Holy Spirit is fully God. The Bible presents this as fact. It does not explain it. And do you know what? I kind of reckon that that is exactly how those first disciples saw it too. They didn't understand it, but they experienced it, as indeed should we. The doctrine of the Trinity, you see, it's not for our heads, it's for our hearts. We need to experience the fullness of this God, who is Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And so, dear friends, on this Trinity Sunday... My prayer for you is that you might experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is God. I pray that you might know the love of the Father, who is God. And I pray that you might be embraced by the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, who also is God. And may you learn to praise God from whom all blessings flow, to praise him with all creatures here below, to praise him with those who are above the heavenly host, and together let's praise Father, Son and Holy Ghost. Amen. Now I'm going to hand over to our songster leader Jonathan Orchin who will uh, introduce uh, a songster piece of music this morning. May God bless you. Hi everyone. Um, so the songster piece today, um, again, isn't actually a songster's piece, but I think that's one of the benefits of um, using the online services. I don't have to stick to the traditional um, music that we use. So uh, today we're going to listen to a song called Trinity Song. I bet you can't guess what I put into Google to find it. Um, and it is written by Sandra McCracken. And you'll notice several techniques in the music um, that relates to the Trinity. So at one point you'll hear uh, three different melodies going on. And then at the end they merge together um, to form one last note. And that represents uh, the Trinity three in one. So uh, I hope you enjoy Trinity Song by Sandra McCracken. <laughs> Holy Communion, three in 
Well, thank you for worshipping with us this morning. We hope that you have been blessed and challenged as you have listened to God's word. We appreciate getting your emails, telling us where you are viewing from. Uh, we've had emails from as far away as Vancouver and Florida, and even Bedford and Croydon. So stay safe, have a good week. Let me share a benediction with you. O Father, let thy love remain. O Son, may I thy likeness gain. O Spirit, stay to comfort me. O triune God, praise be to thee. Amen. And our final song this morning is one of my favourite Geraldine Latte songs. There is a dance that all creation is invited to join. So let's sing together. May God bless you. One, two, three, four. Bye.